Good evening. Um, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 21st regular meeting of the school committee. We have just returned from an executive session and we are ready to convene for our regularly scheduled meeting. I'm going to call the meeting to order and those who are able that would like to stand as we say the Pledge of Allegiance will do so now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a, a pretty good agenda here. With the, we will have a, uh, an opportunity for public comment after we have our recognition. So if there are those who did not see it on our agenda, we are moving it up out of order because it was inadvertently not placed there. Uh, but let's start with our recognitions. And do you want to go ahead and I will do that. that. So our first recognition tonight is Mr. Charles Rockwood. He is an English language arts and social studies teacher at the middle school. Um, I am not going to say much about him because he has brought with him um, Mr. Larney, John P. Larney, who is the state quartermaster for the uh, Veterans of Foreign War. And I'm going to ask him to come on up and bring Mr. Rockwood with you. And you can talk a little bit about the, re the award. If you guys want to just sit right over there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome, Mr. Hi. How are you? Do you want us to sit? Sure, yes. please. Thank you. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And to be official. <clears throat> Going to do a very quick introduction on the VFW. Um, anyone who's a veteran can join the AMVETS. Anyone who served during certain periods of time can jo join the American Legion. To be a member of the VFW, you have to have um, been stationed in a combat zone. And so, a little distinction there. Okay. Chuck, by the way, four years in the Coast Guard? Eight. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I'm trying to buy back four. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, VFW <clears throat> runs several um, programs on patriotism, and uh, we have a middle school program, which Hopkinton seems to win consistently because of Chuck. Uh, that program, by the way, the state awards the first place winner $500. If they go on and win the national competition, they get $5,000. We also have a high school program, and at the state level, we do five, four, three, two, one thousand 1,000, plus another 500 for the rest of the children. <clears throat> if the high school person wins the national competition out of the 54 departments, the basic scholarship is $30,000. So it's some serious money. <clears throat> so about 1999, the VFW decided to recognize three teachers per year, one K through five, one middle school, and one high school. And we're here tonight to recognize Chuck. He was the, out of 54 contestants in the state of Massachusetts, he came out number one. So, thank you. It's really because of our students. It's an honor to um, serve them. So we have a plaque for him. Uh, Charles Rockwood, who I call Chuck, in recognition for his outstanding commitment to teaching Americanism and patriotism to the students, Hopkinton Middle School, Hopkinton Mass, presented by the Department of Massachusetts, and we actually presented it to him on January 27th at a dinner where we recognized the students that had won scholarships. But we'll do a photo op in a minute. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's more than enough to take your wife out to dinner. <laughs> All right. Appreciate that. And I have another check here for the school for $250 for one of his special Thank projects. Very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And thank you for coming out. Don't, Don't go. go yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. This is my mother, Mary, in Rockwood. Oh, oh fabulous. Dr. Kavanaugh. All right. All right. 
You're supposed to hold the flag. Oh, I am? <laughs> well, <I'm sorry. laughs> This is fantastic. Tomorrow's Fun Fact Friday, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in. It's a great one, too. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the Patriots pen, uh, just real quick. Please. It, at the middle, we do the voice of democracy here at the high school, and, and over at the middle school, it's called the Patriots pen. It's an essay contest, and there's always a patriotic theme annually. Well, how it started here in Huffington is we had a hall monitor, a retired educator, Dave Laquadera. Some of you may know Dave Laquadera from town. And he retired as, a, he was a full-time middle school teacher. When he retired, um, he was a hall monitor over at the middle school years ago. And he introduced the Patriots pen to me. He said, we're looking for someone in the school I was, you know, a full-time English teacher at the time, you know, I'm social studies in English. And he said, we're looking for someone to spearhead the Patriots pen essay writing contest at HMS. So I took the lead with that. And for years now, as John mentioned, we've had winners uh, on the state level. And uh, the students that have written the Patriots pen have gone on and written the Voice of Democracy essays here at the high school as well. Again, thank you very much. So, well, so thank you. I, I just want to add, thank you on behalf of all of the entire district, the students, the teachers, everybody, that you bring distinction to our district, but you also, you've touched so many kids. I know years ago you had my daughter who's now in college and she still talks about <laughs> you and, and having run into you in Greece and just all, right. all of the amazing things that you've done with our kids. So this is, a congratulations and really um, thank you, so thank you for all you do. Thank you thank for you your so service much. to the country and thank you for what you do for our district. Appreciate it. We're on so it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. I'll just show you Mr. Rockwood doing his Fun Fact Friday. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> photo right, right there, right Mr. Rockwood. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's paying attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our special, uh, second special recognition tonight is um, Mr. Ed Flannery from the Hopkins School. And I will ask Mrs. Bellello and her students to come on up and talk a little bit about Mr. Flannery. Of course, you need to take the stage in the corner, please. Sure. Oh, you want me in front? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can stand, absolutely. I don't want to block these yeah, guys. Yeah, block me. Block me. Okay. Excellent. All right, my friends, you want to take it away? Good evening, Hopkinton School Committee. Thank you so much for allowing us to come here tonight and honor Mr. Flannery, our retiring head custodian. We are student representatives from the Hawk Squad, the Hopkins Community Service Club. We dedicate our Tuesday afternoons to planning service projects with Mrs. Bolello and Ms. Babson that will benefit our community, school, town, and world. Recently, we honored Mr. Flannery by planning a surprise whole school meeting at Hopkins. It is pretty hard for a school of over 550 fourth and fifth grade students to keep a secret from the head custodian, but we pulled it off. We'd like to share a little poem we read at the whole school meeting in honor of Mr. Flannery. Oh, to our retiring custodian, Ma mops and brooms and feather dusters are used by this cleaning buster. He empties our trash and recycles each night. He makes our hallways sparkle and bright. Of papers placed in the recycling bin, think of our custodian and give a grin. He's kept this building clean for you. Without a custodian, what will we do? Mr. Flannery, we never met a custodian quite like you. For all our messes you undo, just when stuff looks the worst, you're the one who gets there first. You pick up litter, you pick up goo, and if there's any accidents, you deal with that too. We are so very grateful for all that you do. It was great to honor him as a school, but we are pleased to be able to be here to thank him publicly. 
Mr. Flannery has been a critical part of Hopkins School for its entire history, 20 years. He's also helped out as a custodian in other buildings and even served as a high school football coach. He has been an important presence in our district for a long time now. Mr. Flannery has been the jet best janitor ever. He deserves the biggest thank you in the world. Every day he came to Hopkins School to pick up all the me- pick up the messes we made to- and to fix things that we broke. It is not easy job to be a one-man cleaning show with over 600 people making messes each day. So thank you. <laughs> some of some of you may know that Mrs. Borello has a favorite short story she likes to share at Hopkins, the story of the starfish. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there was an old man who used to go to the ocean to do his writing. He had a habit of walking on the beach before he began his work. One day, as he was walking along the shore, he looked down down the beach and saw a human figure moving like a dancer. As he got closer, he noticed that the figure was that of a girl, and that what she was doing was not dancing at all. The young woman was reaching down to the shore, picking up small objects and throwing them into the ocean. The old man came closer still and called out, Good morning, may I ask what it is that you are doing? The girl paused, looked up, and replied, Throwing starfish into the ocean. I must ask, then, why are you throwing starfish into the ocean, asked the somewhat startled old man. To this the girl replied, the sun is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them in, they'll die. Upon hearing this, the old man commented, but young lady, do you not realize that there are miles and miles of beach and there are starfish along every mile? You can't possibly make a difference. At this, the girl began, picked up a starfish and threw it into the ocean. As it met the water, she said, it made a difference for that one. Mr. Flannery, thank you so much for making a difference in the lives of students here in Hopkinton for all these years. Hopkins will miss you very much, but we wish you well on your future journey. Enjoy your retirement. students have said it all we've been really blessed to have you at Hopkins for so long it's a special building and you were a special part of it and we will miss you we know it was not an easy job and none of us really helped make it an easy job but you came to work with a smile and you really were an important part of our community and always will be so thank you for your service And thank you to all the students for coming in. Can I just really fast? I, I have a, um, a secret detective in Hopkins who did a little um, detective work for me. And she came back with, see, I just gave the gender away of this little detective. Sorry, that was unintentional. Um, a couple of, she asked a couple of folks um, if she could, if, um, if they could give me a quote or a statement or something about you that I could say tonight because I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I didn't know we were going to have the fantastic Hawk Squad here to go to, to speak about you. So I just want to share a couple of the ones that stuck out the most. Um, one of my favorites, he helped me get my shoe from the wall. 
<laughs> so that was a good one. Um, he helped me reach my locker where my homework was. Um, he knows all the little secret passageways in the school. Love that one. Um, he fixes thing in the, things in the classroom whenever they need to be fixed. He helped me find my gloves. He showed me how to get to the library. There was this long list of always he helped me, he helped me, he helped me. So you're going to be missed. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Thank you. And our last recognition, but certainly not the least of the evening, um, I'm asking Kristen Murphy to come on up with her high school science fair students. And I will let Kristen just lead the way. Hello. can sit if you want to. We're gonna, Whatever we're gonna try and do a stadium seating here. I don't know if it's gonna work. Just, just do that. We can pull them up. That's fine. Okay. 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 Well, thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. I'm Krista Murphy. I'm a ninth grade chemistry teacher at the high school and I'm the science fair director. And these are a few of our students um, that just competed at the regional fair at WPI and are headed to the state fair at MIT in May. So we're really thrilled to be here today and we really appreciate the support and enthusiasm in town for the science fair. They're going to have a chance to tell you a little bit about their projects, but just to kind of give you the bigger picture this year, we held our school fair for the 31st year, which is one of the longest programs in the state, um, and we were really excited that this year we had more students than ever participate. We had almost uh, 97 students at the school fair, over 50 projects, um, and so many students who were new to the experience that were doing a project for the first time. So we're, I think we're doing a better job every year grabbing more students and a wider a range of students who are getting to experience the real scientific method and study something they love. And I don't know if anyone was able to stop by the day of the fair, but it's my favorite day of the entire year, and it's the most inspiring day as a teacher to see these students choose these topics that mean so much to them or their families or their communities and spend so much time investigating them. Um, and I think it's such a testament to what's happening in this town, everything from the amazing teaching happening K through 8 that's getting them ready to be these great scientists to the support from the parents who are encouraging them and telling them we believe in you and helping them figure out a topic and then most of all um, to our students who with all the activities they're doing in high school and all the demands of classes are finding time to pursue their passions and as you'll hear tackle something that really makes a difference every project and that was the real big theme this year seems to be something that will make a difference in the world and what more could we look for to our future it's such an inspiring day and i couldn't be more proud of these students um, who are some of our top performers but even the simplest project i think that student gets so much out of the experience so we really couldn't do it without the financial and scheduling support of the school committee and the administration and the hbta who's fundamental in our funding every year so thank you so much for having us here i'm going to have every student go through and just tell you their names and their project titles. And then we have three that were some of our top performers that will give you a little snippet and summary of the project. Thank you. So Archita, why don't you guys start? Yeah, so um, my name is Archita. I'm Tanisha. We did a group project, and our project is um, calling 911 when detecting an irregular heart rate. Uh, my name is Freeha Fardeen, and my project was called Spill the Tea Sis, Can Green Tea Prevent and Cure Cancer? Um, yeah, I'm Rohan Minocha. Uh, my project was Systems and Methods for Automated Programmable Dispensing of Medication. Can you tell a little bit about your project? Uh, yeah, so uh, my project uh, is an automatic pill dispensing device, and its purpose is to prevent uh, unintentional injury and unintentional death due to misuse of prescription medications. Um, and it does that through a hardware and software solution. So there's a hardware or a pill dispenser which automatically dispenses medication. Uh, and that works with two different software apps. And both the hardware and the software help to enforce a strict medication schedule so a person can only take their medication in the correct quantity, in the correct manner, and at the correct time. Rohan, could you um, tell the committee where you came up with the idea, what your impetus was? Um, yeah, so I originally came up with the idea um, from looking at my grandmother, so she's almost 80 years old. She has difficulty remembering whether she's taking her medication or she's taking it in the safe prescribed way. So originally, I actually, to, for this project, I looked for a device first for her, and I couldn't find one, so I set out to build my own device, which almost seeks to replace your normal orange pill bottles, 
in which most medication comes in these days. And Rohan was one of the top 10 projects at the regional fair. So we're really excited to see how he does it at States. And there's a lot of interest always from the judges about patenting his project. And so he and his brother are in the works, I think, on that. So stay tuned. There's, there's lots more to come. Congratulations. Um, I'm Elisa. I'm Alana. Um, our project is removing gluten from fryer oil um, because four in a hundred people have some sort of gluten sensitivity. Um, so we wanted to figure out a way to make it safe for them to eat fried food in restaurants by filtering or straining out the gluten from the oil. So we actually made a prototype fryer basket that would allow for restaurants to fry gluten-free food in gluten-contaminated oil, and our procedure was a very simple and practical way for restaurants to do so. And they were fifth place at the regional fair, so out of 130 projects, so very exciting. They were one away from the international fair, so maybe next year, but um, as they said, a simple idea that was done really, really well, which is awesome to see in a science fair and they did a great job. Did it actually work? Because I have yeah. celiac and I would buy that. <laughs> yeah. it, it did work. We were successful. That's super impressive. So they've partnered with one of the big gluten-free testers um, and that the gluten-free watchdog. I also have celiac yeah. so I hear you. Um, so they're going to be publishing their results through some of these websites. So the celiac community is very excited very about happy. this. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Simran Carr and my project is the mystery behind aerial warfare. In this project, I made a model of an aircraft that's invisible to light by using different um, coatings, materials, and fibers that could make the aircraft invisible to light. That's interesting. All of these are so interesting. Um, I'm curious to know about uh, the connection with green tea and cancer. What did you um, find in your research? So I tested if the polyphenols in green tea, which are the catkins in green tea, like what green tea is made of, um, have an effect on a tumor. So I tested, um, so I exposed a living model, and my living model was planaria, and I exposed it to a carcinogen. And the carcinogen I used was Roundup, which is something everyone has in their garage, it's a common herbicide. And I basically established that in high dosages, Roundup does indeed cause cancer, but the polyphenols in green tea can modulate the cancer and kill the cancerous tumors in the living model. That's, that's I, I was so impressed with all of the projects, but I, as I was coming into the high school on the day of the fair, one of the judges was exiting, and it, somebody who does not have a high school is not the parent of a high schooler, and she was so impressed with all of the projects and the level of what goes on here and was all excited as I was on my way. And so I came in and I was really excited. And having seen your projects, it really, it just blows my mind that you've come up with these ideas, really practical things that are helpful in the world. And it's amazing to imagine where you're going if you're doing this in high school, what you're going to be doing in 10 years. So congratulations to all of you. And I look forward to hearing more about you in the future. Yeah, every project sounds so exciting. I'm interested about this invisible, seems like, <laughs> yeah, <that's cool. laughs> uh, airplane, is it aircraft? What? Yeah, so my project is based on stealth technology, which is being used um, in the Air Force nowadays, and how to like maintain that technology for the Air Force to use. Wow. wow. Amazing. Amazing. So I'd like to tell you guys, I wasn't able to go, but my husband went, and he, um, he definitely isn't, doesn't go easy when he is in the role of judge. He likes to grill folks and try to see how much you, they really, he came home and he said, there were some kids, he's like, I would hire them. He's an engineer, he's like, they, we would hire them on the spot. Like, there was that much of a, um, you guys spoke at such a high level, you had such a deep understanding of what you were talking about, that he was so impressed. So a huge compliment to all of you on just a fantastic job because it, it really shows how passionate you are about what you came up with and what you were able to create and good job. Good job, everybody. And thank you, Ms. Murphy. You know, yeah. you've been in the background, it seems like, but we know how much you do and your team does. Thank to make you. This yes, happen. we have a, a great group of mentors at the high school, so thank you. Thank and you. We really appreciate your support. Great job, guys. Great thank job. you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. You guys everybody. can go home and study next round. <laughs> So at this uh, uh, point, I'm going to offer an opportunity. If there's anybody here that would like to come up to speak and make a public comment, you can do so now. Uh, if you want to come up, and you can take a seat and state your name just for the record. And Sit here. Yes, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Robin Malone. Um, I sent an email to the school committee on Wednesday, and I just wanted to put a face with a name. Um, we, uh, my husband and I, have two um, boys who are um, who have special needs and are receiving special education services here in town. And I just wanted to say we moved here five years ago, and they have made tremendous progress um, in those five years. And we couldn't be more thrilled with the school district and the education that they're getting. And I really just wanted to express that and express how grateful I am for, um, for this town and for um, the excellent um, education system that you guys have in place and that especially for us the special education and I think it's a, a tremendous program and um, I think it it speaks um, a lot to the head of the special education which is the director of student services so that's pretty much all I wanted to say thank so you thank, thank you very you. much for coming and sharing such positive a lot of times you know people don't want to come out at night and speak in front of TV and I, it really is much appreciated yeah thank you thank, thank you, you. Very much. All right. Do we? Uh, we do not have anyone from student council here right now. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So then, um, do you want to move the bus? Yeah. Uh, why don't we take the um, bus parking lot report uh, out of order? Um, and slide. So do we want to have them? Oh. So and I invite. Uh, is Ch Chief, Chief Slaman? I think Chief Slaman is supposed to come right, as so well, let's though. Hold off. Let's yeah. Wait maybe then. we should Sorry, wait. I did not realize. Yep. If you want to. Text him and say get going. When when he's here, we will we will take him. But do you want to well, go ahead into the financial report while we're? Uh, I'll go I'll go right into the financial report. Um, so what you have before you is the financial report through um, March 12th, and as you can see from the cover page. Uh, right now, we are still running a positive variance of 94,000. Um, some of the things that I will caution going forward, you know, each month this is kind of a look and a projection as to, as to where we are. Um, some of the things that I have adjusted for this were increasing the projection for substitutes at the elementary level. Um, that is something going forward that it looks as though we'll have an overrun. And that is reflected in here. What is not reflected in here, and I think we'll change this number going forward, are potential for the legal costs to change moving forward. So I, I see that as decreasing what we have um, right now as, as a positive variance, um, because I do think that that's something we'll, that will change in, in the future. Um, so are there any questions? You can see from the payroll, right now we're running a positive variance of 69000 and the expense accounts at 25000 And the details of all the changes um, are on the previous, the next following pages. This is all great news. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Even with all those positions added, yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Always, three more months. Three more months. All right. Thank you. A few more months. All right. So, Dr. Kavanaugh, then, if you'd like to go. Okay. Sure. So, I'll give you my superintendent's report. Um, I start off with just some goings on. On Saturday, March 9th, um, I think more than 30 people convened in this room to do the focus groups for our strategic planning. Uh, I want to say thank you to Hef, who provided breakfast for us on that day. I've been in contact with Cindy Boney, who is our DESI consultant, and she's currently still compiling all of the information that she took on that day. Uh, so I'm anticipating that she'll have that for me uh, by no later than Monday for sure, if not late tomorrow afternoon. Um, I have a, a live link there on strategic planning, and we can just sort of take a look quickly to show you that we're pretty much on, on target in terms of timeline. 
So if we scroll down to uh, March 21st, which is where we are today, um, I am slated to present an update to the school committee uh, on the strategic planning work, if there is any, and really I can just tell you about the event of March 9th. I was really pleased with how many people came out and the focus groups I thought were, you know, a lot of people were very much invested in them and had a lot to say, and I think that we actually gathered, I think, a lot of data. So um, I'm interested to see what it is that Cindy puts together for us. I just want to say I thought um, it was an excellent, excellent day. I, I really was appreciative of um, the quality of the consultant that you were able to find. I th thought you did a great job. I think your preparation was um, really instrumental in making that day run well. And people came; they had done their reading, mm -hmm. their assigned readings ahead of time. There was really rich discussion. So um, hopefully, we got some good, some good output because yes. it seemed like there was a lot being shared and brainstormed and so forth. It was fun. A lot of good energy. Yes. Um, the same weekend, the high school had their spring play, Radium Girls, and I don't know if anyone got out to see that, but um, it's a historical fiction piece, and it was really well done. Uh, it's one of those plays that kind of stays with you because of the tie to history, you know, that sort of thing that lingers in your mind for days afterwards. So, um, you know, kudos to uh, Ms. Rosenvinger and, and her students. It was a, it was a great production. Uh, what you see here are the kids who were just before you. Um, they, these are the students who were competing at WPI at the Regional Science Fair. I'm sure some of those kids will look very familiar to you. Sure. Yep. Uh, we had steam night at the Elmwood School. So here are just some pictures that I took while I was uh, zipping around. Um, the way they work this is that you sort of have this passport, so you go to a science, a technology, and engineering, and art, and a mathematics session. Uh, so you can see families just having a wonderful time. I don't know, Mrs. Carver, what you think about percentage, but about 95%, I think, of your second graders came out, do you think? I think they said all but 40 students were in attendance. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Maybe 10 of them were in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will say that parking was a little challenging at the only school on that night. It was the only thing that I heard from anybody that was a negative was yeah. that the parking was extremely challenging. Yeah. We typically park on the field and we didn't have, excuse me, didn't have access to it because of the snow. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I think another amazing thing about Steam Night at Elmwood is it's not sort of limited to Elmwood. I mean, you'll see teachers from the high school, you'll see tons of high school kids running around and parents, and it's really just an amazing night. How many people have to come together to put, I mean, I don't know how many different stations you had, but, you know, my guess is there could have been like 30 of them. I would say that's probably about right. Yeah. Uh, we had two community reading days, and interestingly enough, uh, both at Hopkins and Elmwood. We had the same book chosen the day you begin. And I was actually thrilled to see this because, first of all, I love Jacqueline Woodson, but uh, I was also very happy to see that um, the text was chosen um, in support of our diversity and inclusivity uh, work that we've been doing all year. It's a great book. It was. It, a great that's a book, really fun it? event. Uh, a couple of other things. So Carla Crisofuli, who is the math subject matter leader here at the high school, has um, established a partnership with Mass Bay Community College. And so students here at the high school will be able to take tuition-free uh, dual enrollment um, computer science scripting courses. So that's brand spanking new. It's not going to cost any student uh, any money at all, but they will be able to earn college credits while um, enrolled in high school. So that's exciting. And the second thing um, in terms of curriculum is that we have our seal of biliteracy almost up and running. And I want to thank Jill Kimball, uh, Marilyn Miracle, you mean for your work in that, Jen, for your work in that. Uh, but it is an amazing achievement to have our kids recognized because they are able to speak two languages fluently and to get that seal on their diploma when they leave high school. So. Kudos to everyone who's been involved in that. Uh, this one is the uh, middle school. Uh, this team right here is our um, New England champion uh, STEM research and skills uh, students right here. So, you know, Doug Scott is always wonderful about tweeting that information out, but just a little shout out to those kids who have done very well. Um, and uh, just a couple of loose ends. Uh, I have. Just this revision 
to the page two that we had talked about last time. After our last meeting, I had asked Georgette to put this out and to sort of solicit any information from people about dates that we did not have on this particular calendar. So you can see that the items on this calendar that are in blue font, All Saints Day, Feast of Immaculate Conception, Three Kings, Orthodox Christmas, and the Feast of the Ascension are those that people suggested adding. And so I will have Georgette post this again tomorrow morning. And if it stays here, stays up for the next couple weeks, we will probably just put it to a vote next time we are together on April 4th, I believe. I don't see blue font. Mine yeah, when blue. I say no, blue. Okay, okay, my eyes are going. That's all right. They're aging. Nope. <laughs> I totally get it. And the last thing about the Hopkinton High School edition, this has been uh, sort of a part of this like urban lore problem that I think that we've had for a very long time. So I can recall people saying to me that when this school was built, there are footings somewhere, they're all ready, you can actually build an addition, uh, build an addition on it. And then Tim Person, who is the director of building and grounds, had brought me some drawings, and his drawings sort of indicated that that addition had already been built. But if you're standing behind the high school, you'll see that there are two wings that project out, one shorter than the other. What we learned today, we met with Chuck Joseph and we were able to also find the appropriate drawings. And what we learned today is that in the process of building the high school in 1999, the Enrollment here was so rapidly growing that they actually did build on one of the additions, but the second edition has not yet been built, and it would accommodate six classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, yes, which is pretty amazing, I think. Um, there, you know, the two of them were sort of guessing that you might be somewhere around $500 per square foot, which might come out to about, you know, three quarters of a million dollars for each one of those classrooms. So that's kind of, and I don't even want to sort of commit to that number, but that's the, you know, sort of sitting by the table, armchair kind of um, numbers that we were throwing around today. Uh, according to Chuck and according to all of the drawings, uh, the uh, systems, so any of the plumbing, the HVAC, all of that stuff was originally designed to be able to accommodate those six new classrooms. So really, um, when we thought about what would be the most effective way to do that, uh, you could technically build the outside of that addition while kids were in class, and then in the period between you know June 15th and you know August 25th, you'd have to take a stairwell and push it out to the end of that corridor and extend a corridor. Uh, so that would be, I think, a significant amount of construction as opposed to just sort of building walls. So that's that's something that I think we should probably think about as a district, and it's something that I. Also also believe would not be MSBA um, reimbursed so you know that's something that the town should just get you know some um, you know sort of take a look at how much we think that that would actually cost we can go back to the original architects and then uh, you know think about putting that out to bid in subsequent years so at least we have something definitive now we know that there is actually a place that you can build on six classrooms so in, so in the back, there's the six over six extension and then the four over four classroom. And then yes. so where would these additional six classrooms go? It would be attached to the four over four. Okay. But it would be three levels. Okay. So there would be two, two, two oh. and two. Okay. So that does not interfere with the bus parking lot. It does all. not interfere with the bus parking lot, no. I mean, right now there's sort of patio built right there. And did you say each classroom, I know you said it's a rough number, uh, did you say 750000 per classroom? Yes, rough. but I would not yeah. want to go on record with that number. <laughs> That's just three people sitting in a room saying, what do you think? Sure. So, yeah. And in terms of need, um, you think this is something that could accommodate growth up to a certain point? Was that also part of the conversation? So Mrs. Rothermick and I got information from the three high school administrators and this week, and what we have learned is that there are 68 available classrooms in the high school. At this point, uh, the first period, of, uh, period one, but it's rotating obviously, is um, the period during which most classrooms are filled, and they are filled to 65. So 65 out of the 68 classrooms are filled um, to capacity at that 
point in time. I think what is a little bit interesting is uh, it's, it's fine when that falls in the first sort of period of the day because you can use the cafeteria area if you want to put kids into study halls. But when you get that block would move to the lunch period, you can't use the cafeteria. So the three available classrooms would have to house all of the students who are um, in the building at that point or you know kids can leave because we have for seniors that open campus. So the three, Did I get that all right? mm -hmm. the three additional classrooms then hold, they're probably being used then for study halls during when it's not that first period? Is that, if, if right. the study right. hall can't be going on in the cafeteria, those three have during to be lunch. used during lunch. Yeah. And is that not adequate right now or is that close to being not adequate? No, I think they're okay now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, basically, and that, that was the, the most full. Mm -hmm. When you got down to seventh period, I believe the um, space usage was around 59 of the 68. So 65 of the 68 was the highest use. And, you know, of course, every period is different based sure. on scheduling. Um, but we need a PhD to understand the schedule in high school, I think. <laughs> I, I agree. But 65 of the 68 was the highest use. So there's flexibility. If you talk about three additional classrooms, it's different than how you would think of elementary, where three classrooms yeah. equals 60 kids. Sure. Because you can take those kids and spread them out among 68 classrooms. So those three additional spaces actually equates to a lot of kids. Is what I'm saying. That's, yep. Okay. That's great. And then we have the potential to do in addition down the road, and hopefully the potential if we're able to make the improvements to the 18 to 22 program, that would free up some additional classrooms in here as well. But, um, that's great. And Thank you. Just, um, just again on the usage, did uh, Mr. Bishop comment on sort of the bespoke classrooms, like the the science labs, it, the ones that you can't just sort of a lot of teachers share classrooms or there's movement. Are there is our capacity in the specially designed classrooms currently sufficient? I know we don't know what the right. growth will be, but. There has been no talk about any of the specially designed classrooms not. I think okay. in looking at, because we took a tour um, with Mr. Bishop and Mr. Pominville and Mr. Person, and I think when there's a, a specialized classroom in some cases it's for you know special education needs like those are the classroom spaces that it feels like we're sort of struggling to free up a little bit okay. right um, you know sometimes when you look and you say you know in a particular academic support period there may only be five students you know you like to put five students in a classroom that fits five students and put 25 students in a classroom that fits 25 students so there's a lot of shuffling for sure that goes on around all day okay. That's all. That is all for your report. Yes. Okay, so for the school committee chair report, I have approved payroll warrant S19019, and the payroll warrant has been included in your packet. And I have approved the accounts payable warrants 19 079, 19 080, 19 081, 19 082, and 19 083. <coughs> all warrants have been included in your packet. And then uh, in as an update on the school committee office hours that Mina and I did over at Legacy Farms, it was tremendous. Uh, we had almost 15 people there. Yeah, easily. It, it was, and it was, there were, the room that we were in, which was a great room, there was not even enough seating because they were, they all were right there at the beginning. There was a lot of enthusiasm to engage with us. People, many of whom are new to the community, had questions and, you know, brought forward some different, different things that they wanted to ask questions about and ask concerns about um, things, everything ranging from, uh, you know, questions about the transitions into the schools when the people are moving here. Uh, one comment from a person who had been very happy about that and then some other questions. And then there was, and I think this went out to the entire school committee about the questions about the Legacy Farms North bus. So that was a topic of conversation as well. And I, am, I had a conversation with Susan about the what has been kind of happening in the background of the the school is not able to run the bus up there because it's a private road. And that's sort of their frustration is trying to figure out uh, how 
to get those kids not waiting in the at the bottom of that road where traffic can be heavy with the buses and they have another issue is that they have trucks and things going through they're doing construction still in the development and they're trying to figure out how they can address the situation um, and to date a solution has not emerged but we are hopeful that something will work out to make that better so it is difficult because our ability with the we can't make the bus company drive up there we can't make the town accept the road as a public road because it's not completed and there are risks inherent in that so more to be to come on that so there is a plan though at some point to there accept is a, it as, a, as there, a public road once it's everything's done up I, there. I believe so the <laughs> issue is there's still a couple of years left of mm -hmm. construction and it's a lot of kids coming yeah. down and they the, there are photos they had sent along it. I, I yeah, they, they included them in the email, yeah. It, it, it is a concerning situation for them, and it's just hard to figure out what the solution is. When we're, our hands are tied, we can't make right. other people do something outside of our purview, but we also, where we can't make the bus company go up there either, and mm -hmm. we have to contract just with our bus company. Do you know if the road completion is on schedule? I don't know what the schedule is because they have to finish all the homes up there before it's finished. Like they won't, it, until the development is completely done, the town won't accept it. And I think there's, I, I'm not into construction, but my understanding is there's something they do to the road after they're done with the construction and there aren't so many vehicles going on it. Um, you know, again, it's not the official word, but one of the parents had expressed that about four years, four more years. Um, to go and, and I guess the concern that we shared was this right like from a school's perspective we have certain you know it's our purview is limited in in a certain instance but at the same time you feel for the situation mm -hmm. and what the kids are experiencing and you know sometimes errors happen with the you know drop off or what have you so it, it's a painful situation however you look at it. So one of the suggestions was, um, you know, from a school committee standpoint, would we be able to set or, you know, kind of put some, have some influence on the builder, right? And we don't know what influence necessarily we have on the builder, uh, but the one thought was if there is a meeting that's called out with all parties to talk about it, there, you know, we will come back to the school committee and ask if there's willingness to attend such a meeting um, and see where we go with it. So, and I, so then we, I, I would definitely recommend that we go back to Legacy Farms at another point in the future just because they were very interested in engaging with us and that we then set forward at some point another date for April office hours in a, perhaps a different location. We had talked about the Senior Center um, is one location we'd like to hit. I don't know if people have other thoughts on hot spots in town. We can, we can. Legacy Farms was actually very cozy. It was yes, really nice, um, the office space that they have. It's like their clubhouse. Mm -hmm. It's really <laughs> nice. So that is um, all I have for school committee office hours. Do we want to go ahead and um, do the, bring the bus parking lot? I think so, yes. Presentation. Since all of our bus parking lot people are here. <laughs> And I, I will say, I forgot to say this in my um, chair report, but I did receive uh, feedback from one of the community reps from the middle school council that they had actually, ironically, unrelated to the fact that we were having a presentation here, had been discussing the drop off and pick up at the middle school and concerns about traffic flow there and the hope that this bus parking lot would alleviate some issues on the campus as a whole during that. See that back for a second. Yeah. Right. Do you want to run it? I'll press the button, you okay. do the talk. <laughs> so thank you. Um, introduce obviously Chief Lee and um, and uh, Phil Powers that are also here. They have witnessed firsthand everything that we're going to talk about. So um, adding their expertise from an emergency management standpoint is important. Um, we can talk about it in terms of what it means from an operational standpoint here at the at the district. Um, so, just to kind of step back because this has been going on for two years. 
Um, so in 2017, we put together a scope of services basically for the campus master plan in looking at basically how can we do all of this better. Um, so what we had looked at was the traffic flow evaluation. So it was a full evaluation of the existing traffic circulation as it relates to bus students and parent vehicles. And what you'll hear later when you talk to um, transportation engineers, they, they speak of the multimodal transportation. In other words, there's all different avenues of people getting to and from uh, a campus. Um, again, develop recommendations for the efficient traffic pattern, um, getting all waiting traffic onto campus. So this began before the Hayden Row project uh, was completed as well. Um, also before there was a turf field. So just to kind of bring you back that far. And the separation of the bus and vehicle traffic was a priority. Going to the next slide, parking was also one of the uh, priorities in the scope of services. Looking at the location and size of student parking lots as it relates to the efficiency, ease of access to the school building and the number of student drivers. One of the big conversations that we had was what can we do to bring the students up from the back of the school in terms of the safety of kids walking down there late at night, after sporting events, whatever it was. Uh, evaluating the staff parking lots as it relates, again, to the efficiency and ease of access to the building. Evaluates visitor parking for the same and determining space for bus parking up to 28 buses. And as you know, now we will, in FY20, have 29 buses. And one thing I will add is, uh, so I had asked Mr. Bishop to let me know how many students right now are currently on a wait list for student parking here, and the number is 40. Okay. There are 40 kids who would like to be driving to school, but there is no room for their car. And lastly, the last two pieces were safety, um, basically looking at all users within the campus for safety as it related to the lighting, security cameras, signage, and again, that distance from the buildings. And the other um, look was where, as we look at a full campus, could we put some type of a storage facility? So again, this was a long-term look. Um, where we were going because we didn't want to make a move without thinking about the full plan of, of all these different things and what it would affect. So from the master plan, the, the step one in what was called phase one was the school bus lot, and that is how it was put on the town meeting in 2018, was step one of this master plan which spoke to this. So again, our current conditions, what we're looking at doing is, again, the, that separation of that multimodal, so the separation of the bus and vehicle traffic, which we currently have at all of our schools except here at the middle school, high school. Marathon, you have the buses in the back, the parents in the front. Elmwood, you have the buses in the front, parents are in the back. Hopkins, again, buses are in the back and the parents are in the front. But the middle school and high school right now, we have everything in the front of the building. So again, current conditions, there are over 1,500 students registered to ride the bus. There's currently 28 buses. You have 60 students that are exiting to go to the senior lot, 40 going to the tennis court lot. You have four to five driving schools and over 35 parent cars. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like out there, that's over 1,700 students and 160 vehicles all in the same area. So again, the, um, the, the, the goals was that separation of bus and vehicle traffic, uh, the safety of the students, and emergency access. Again, looking at that multimodal, you have walkers, you have parent cars, you have bus cars, you have student cars, you have bike riders. Um, so lots of different things, lots of activity going on <coughs> in the same place. Now these next two slides just really is, shows some um, excerpts from traffic engineer studies, if you will. Um, Basically, the first one, school bus loading areas should be separated from parent drop-off and pickup areas, if at all possible. 
separate the school bus loading and parking areas from automobile parking areas. This separates both the buses and bus riders from automobile traffic. And this last one, providing for a physical separation of basic modes is both a design issue, layout of separate driveways, loading areas, et cetera, and an operation issue, enforcement of bus zones, supervision of crosswalks. And this paper was interesting because this citation, this picture they used as a site layout to avoid, which pretty much is what we have. We just have that raised curb separating the buses and the, um, and the vehicles. And so that was a citation of, of what to avoid. So in the discussions over these years, we looked at all different areas around campus of where could we put the buses to solve and separate some of the, um, all of these different avenues that we've been talking about. So you can see in this first slide, we looked at stacking them in the front. What you see basically is a visual of what 29 buses would look like. Um, that's approximately 700 feet of queue. And the red X's represent all of the areas of conflict. Um, so there are several parking lots that are blocked and the emergency access between the middle school and high school um, would be blocked as well. So this was one avenue that we looked at um, going and to- Before we go to the next slide, yeah. there's one thing that I, I, I do wanna say about this, not necessarily that configuration, but the configuration that we have now. If you look at where that crosswalk comes down toward Hayden Row, um, and it, it wouldn't matter if the buses were queued there or if they're currently in our bus loop. We have kids who step off of that curb and we have cars coming into the middle school, buses exiting, and, and the, so that crosswalk for me is one of those places of, of concern. And then as I look at that student parking lot or even the faculty parking lot, we have kids who are getting out of those cars and walking toward the building or exiting the building and walking toward their cars while parents are picking up. So kids are constantly walking in the flow of traffic and those are the two places for me in this configuration or the current configuration that make me very nervous when I'm out there. So the next- If we can go back, I think that's what the fire chief would speak as, that no fire apparatus could get to the front of the school. You, with this configuration yeah. you mean, yes. Right. Yeah. right. yeah, I just wanted that's a problem. to note that I did speak with the Chief Slam and he got tied up on something. But uh, that was the, one of the big key issues is Correct. emergency access. Right, and I know, um, so everybody, like I said, over these years, we've had multiple conversations. And one of the things that Chief Slayman did say um, is also not only the fact that the vehicles are there, but it's that visual um, clearance as well. And it's a lot easier for an apparatus to see over a car, but not so much to see over a bus. So having them there not only blocks it physically, but also visually. And you have the tennis court lot where kids would be able to get out to uh, go home till after two o'clock. Correct. So all of those lots are blocked in this configuration. <laughs> so this next one is looking at the back of the campus and using basically that emergency access all along. So. In order to do this, again, you would need to add probably a minimum of 10 feet to create a safe distance between the, the building, the buses, and for students to be able to walk. Um, and there are elevation changes so that, you know, this is not a free, this isn't something we could just do. Um, it also blocks Hopkins Road, as you can see. And again, it takes away the entire back emergency access um, for our emergency personnel. When these buses were to exit, they would also exit through the middle school parent dismissal, and again, is another conflict area. You also have 90 students parked in the water tower lot where they'd have to be walking by those buses to get to that lot. Mm -hmm. So this would be bringing the buses up between the buildings. Um, 
So probably the access to do this is you would bring them in. This one becomes very difficult because the access of where you go to create what is, what is considered door side. If you bring them in from the bus loop, then door side faces the middle school, but then when you get down below, it's facing field nine and kids have to walk around to the opposite end. If you bring them up from Hopkins Road in between, then door side faces the buildings, but that road between middle school and high school is very tight, and now again, you have door side facing the building. So even this configuration, and the other piece too between both of those um, going all the way behind and then this, you never have clear visual sight for an all clear. Um, so you have to go around multiple corners to determine that you have an all clear of, of students. And this here, the, uh, the entire population of the middle school that uh, comes to the buses would be coming out right where that first bus is. Right. So they'd be walking next to the buses. Yeah, it, which is alarming, I think, with that notion of the all clear, right? Yeah. yeah. Because inevitably, you'll have some student who's late who decides to you know, race down to that very last bus. And sure. when those buses start moving. Right. And then this last configuration was really just, again, looking at you know, a potential of a double stack. And what could that do? Um, again, this interferes with middle school. Um, parent drop-off, you would lose parking in that parking lot. You do not have that full visual all clear. Um, your sight lines are, are very much affected. Um, so these are just all the places that we looked. So we played around as much as possible. Um, you know, even Phil rode on buses with us and we tried to see where a bus would fit. So there has been a lot of discussion about that. Um, so then lastly, what we came up with was really using field nine. It pushes it out of the emergency access road. It gives the buses the ability to come in and out from the Hopkins Drive. There is a walkway that um, still allows the students to get down to the lower lots. Um, the current way that the kids walk through the middle of the, of the lot, um, you know, there's an elevation change. So as we build this lot, the more natural uh, student progress would be down either one of the driveways as opposed to cutting through the middle, which you see them do now. And then you have a very clear visual. Um, they're always in front of the buses. One of the things that you always talk about, even when you're establishing a bus stop, is you try to make it so that students are approaching buses from the front. So with this, configuration when students are coming down again they'll always be facing and and um, the, the they're coming at it from from the front as opposed to the back keeps the emergency access road free um, right now the the lot is planned to have driver spaces as well if we continue and need to increase um, the number of buses that would fit down in there, then we would reduce the number of driver spots and they would have to caravan, which they do now for different events. If they're having a safety meeting, they all meet in one area and they caravan to the, the safety meeting. So that's not an unusual thing for them to do. Um, so we feel that there's room for growth in this area, um, you know, even if we increase the buses. So. So I'll let uh, these two fine gentlemen speak a little bit more if they have more to add. May I just ask one question? Mm -hmm. So is it 33 buses, um, space for 33 buses in there right uh, now? 30. 30. 30. 30. Yeah. Okay. Can you, and, can we, and 33 bus driver spaces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think one of the nice parts about having your buses parked on your campus is in the event of an emergency, those buses can become a place for our kids to leave the building and go into those buses. I mean, if you're, you know, God forbid, having something like a bomb scare, right, and you don't want to actually send all of your kids home, they can go into those buses. And then the other issue, I think, is that instead of your driver getting called to go to Ashland to pick up a bus and bring that bus to Hopkinton, that driver simply has to get in his car and get to that lot right there. So it probably saves about 20 minutes time. So in terms of 
I don't know, emergency, it, it might be helpful to have your buses on campus. This will also give us more parking out front of the school if we, if the buses are parked there and um, we're going to use the bus loop for parent pickup and in front of the uh, in front of the school. So we'll have two areas for parent pickup, which will take the cars off the road, which will take the cars out of the parking lots. Um, so right now in the F lot where the the uh, senior lot is. That's the overflow for teachers. So the the uh, row of cars that run parallel with the driveway, uh, that's for uh, staff and um, teachers. They can move over to the bus loop where uh, by the island, where we could put at least um, I think 20 spaces, and that will leave the senior lot for uh, completely just for students. Yeah, in a future slide, we'll show kind of the potential of, of what we could do. So can you just talk a little bit about the student drivers who park in H, J, and K lots? How many kids, and how would they get to the lots, I especially believe that, J and K? Sure. Uh, J and K, they usually, well, they, they go down the loop road, and uh, there's up, up actually a path. Right, by Hopkins, right? By Hopkins. Before you get to the Hopkins, and it comes right out in J lot. That's great when, there's, when the snow is not there, and it's a nice, clean path. Uh, if not, then they have to walk in front of the Hopkins School to get to uh, K lot. Yeah. We also have 12 spots for students in the uh, Hopkins lot, too, which is the, the furthest lot down. But they tend to go like out the back to the left. They go out the back to the right. To the left. Now uh, they To go left. down to J and K. Yeah, That's correct. Um, and people go into H lot, there would be a walkway. Right now there's a path that they can uh, get out to the loop road. So there are like 80 kids in there's, J and K? I say? think there's about 80 spots Sorry. between J and K. 74. 74, and, and then there's like 32 or so in H lot. And at dismissal, I have a student driver, can you tell? Mm -hmm. <laughs> at dismissal, I know the... Uh, just normal days, the exiting onto 85, all, they all get in the cars at once, they all back <coughs> to about the split with the Hopkins Drive sometimes, with just the student cars. Say that again, I'm sorry. When the students are <coughs> exiting at the end of the day, they all, yeah. they all come up at once. The queue to get out, out onto 85 goes back sometimes to close it to does. the split, yeah. right? It's, it's congested. <coughs> so the advantage when the buses are in this lot is now our crossing guard would be at Hopkins Drive and his job is to stop traffic and get the traffic out of the campus so that the buses would move so now all of our young student drivers would actually have that crossing guard that would be stopping traffic and getting them out which right now they're just darting because our crossing guard is really responsible for the high school drive to get the buses out but now if the buses are using Hopkins Road to access this parking lot, the crossing guard would be there as well. And it, he would be continuing to clear that driveway because when those buses roll, we need those buses to go. We can't have that driveway filled with student drivers. So it actually increases the safety of the student drivers. And we'll it, have to hold the traffic at all the exit points onto the loop road to allow the buses to get out, right? Once the buses roll, there, there's, we have dispatch there. Okay. Yeah, once you get that first bus out, yeah. it'll all fall. Yeah, I'll go. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we have that problem now anyways, uh, because you can't, when you come out of the school, you can't take that left turn anymore. Right. There you can't. Everybody's <laughs> <that>. um, <laughs> But so that's even congested even more right now. Yeah. I was, I'm hoping if this does go through that you will be able to take a left turn out of the school someday again. So. And that might, you know, stop. You won't be dealing with any of the buses in front, which sure. you currently uh, do now. And you'll be, you mentioned in, uh, when we met in your office that there's more room for parents to queue up now if the buses are in the back and we don't have uh, anybody queuing up on the, on the road, which right. can be dangerous. So we'll, we'll move along. Um, so the other concerns that we had talked about really were just kind of the enrollment and space needs, um, which Dr. Kavanaugh spoke to already in terms of really the back 
we've got that ability. You can see that that six over six wing and the four over four wing. So the um, preliminary plans for future would be to add on to that smaller four over four wing. And you also still do have room in the front if that was something that um, an, an engineer decided was also another potential to add on. So our other benefits with doing this is that improved traffic flow, which is what we spoke about as part of the master plan, increasing parking, and of course, lastly, a, a financial impact. So two things that we looked at, two different configurations um, of what could this mean if we move the buses to the back. This first configuration gives you about 1,200 feet of available queue within the campus, like Chief Lee spoke about. Gives you um, an additional 92 potential parking spaces that could be built out. So again, this is future building out if we just move the buses, you could create those 32 spaces in, in the front, in the bus lot, um, without too much construction. Um, the advantages of this is, is also to be looking at potentially building a driveway that actually comes out where the light is. Um, there's discussions that would have to happen with that. But you can see there's potential to add on to different uh, parking areas to increase the parking, again, looking at our long-term plan in terms of students and staff. Another configuration Excuse would me, these be... Are, these are all outside of the proposed project right now. That is correct. Okay. This, again... It's a phase. When you want to look at your master plan, yeah. you want to know what's next and what's next and what's next. Yeah. So if, then what? Um, so these are other potential if you were to loop the parent traffic actually through the... Um, the bus loop it gets the parent cars actually closer to the building both on the middle school and high school side it does cut down on the number of parking spaces that you could do and it does cut down a little bit on that parent queue but these again are our future discussions of what what could be if we were to move that mr altamek what are yes. the two-way operations near the tanks I'm sorry? On the right side. So over at the water tower, that would be the other thing, is to look at actually, that right now is just a one way in, but maybe expanding that driveway a little bit so it was a two way. So really trying to create different avenues to get parents both in and out. Um, when you have a one way in and a one way out on the other side, again, that becomes confining. And lastly, what we have talked about in, uh, in our budget discussions is the financial impact. Um, the contractor has agreed to give us a credit towards the busing contract of $50,000 a year, and the excise revenue has been estimated um, a receipt of $50,000. So that has an annual financial impact of $100,000 if we were to get this completed. Can you speak to um, what parent pickup would look like with just the expenditure of this project? Like, if we put the bus parking lot in, what could we do without spending any additional money that would change parent pickup? Do we have a picture of the school now out front? I think Any so. Chance? I think at the beginning. Like the, yeah, the beginning, the one where the Yeah, that's good right there. there. So right now the parent pickup is... I actually asked for one. We didn't have one. I apologize. I did try to get my hand on a laser pointer. We didn't have one. We're not the shortest one. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you a ladder. We have the current parent pickup right here that goes up and around. Yeah. Um, so we have a second one that would come in here in the bus will be come and pick up on the side here next to the sidewalk. This is the area I was talking about for additional parking for staff. So you'd have two areas, and that would take... Right now, we have cars queued up into the parking lots, the staff parking lots. So they're sitting there waiting for their child to come out. So you have kids trying to leave in their cars. They can't back out because cars are parked there. Kids are leaving. Parents are leaving. And you have you know, a lot of students. And I think in senior life, you have almost 90 uh, parking spaces for students. They're walking out there. 
Plus, they're walking. I mean, they drive the cars from here to here. It's a lot closer to that door. But uh, <laughs> the athletes. So, That's a true uh, story. They so do So you'd that. have two places <laughs> for uh, parent pickup, which would open up all those parking lots. And it would, uh, the danger would be minimized. Mr. Rathamek, I must say this is great job. It's very visual, you know, all the questions and concerns I had uh, felt uh, when we met last time. I think you've addressed them beautifully, Good. and um, all the visuals are extremely helpful. Good. Uh, I'm fully supportive of this. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So the only downside I see is what do the kids use Field 9 for now? What, what would that take away from them? I mean, this is great. I've, obviously, it seems like we have to go with it, but what, what are we taking away? So before, before we even went there, we did ask. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I needed to. We did ask what impact this would have um, of Ms. King, and she said it really does not affect from an athletic um, program standpoint. And PE and other stuff that, no, yeah. nothing. Okay. I think yeah. it's used currently it's for intramurals, like um, club ultimate frisbee, like recreational activities, which could probably go to some other field. They also use it occasionally for um, Lake Hillerfest, which is sort of a, it is a nice place to combine oh, the indoor outdoor down. activity because it's cafeteria plus field, and mm. the V Free uses that for that kind of thing. They would lose that, but it's minimal. I think it's minimal use as a okay. field. Yeah, it's just a practice field, and some kids do go out there in the nice weather, but you still also have that nice patio out back, too. Okay. Um, when they have a, any type of function, they can go over to the middle school football field if Mr. Keller will allow them to. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ms. Rathamit, just one question that I have is when you were going through these proposals, were some of the students involved uh, and some parents in these conversations, have they had a chance to provide some input? Uh, we did not speak with students, no, but we were speaking really with the administration. I mean, actually, Phil would probably have yeah. a better beat on the students than I I would. have talked to a lot of students, and when you say anything about additional parking, right. They're in favor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. My, I, I just have, um, so first of all, this is a huge undertaking. I mean, this is like one of those magic squares, and you can never get the numbers in order because it's like you move one thing, and then where is the other thing going to go? So I appreciate this uh, undertaking. It's a lot. <clears throat> My biggest hesitation on the whole thing, um, I'm convinced we need a lot there, is just putting buses there because you know, in addition, I mean, I know the students want more parking, staff needs more parking, the staff lot is crazy over full. I mean, you see the cars all around the periphery in, in like non-spots because there's nowhere to park for staff. When we have parent back to school night, concerts, any event that parents go to, there's no parking. So it just it takes a very prime location and it puts buses there, which I get a lot of this, it's just very, frustrating to me that we don't have a better option that will put the buses somewhere else and let staff or stu students use that space or parents at night or also parking for the turf field. So, you know, I I'm not an engineer. M my dream would be to put a staff lot there and have parent pickup move to the back of the school and put the buses on J and K. That's my dream. That's kind of what I came up with. I you know, it probably isn't feasible. You would lose all the parking for the uh, juniors by taking those two lots, those are uh, the, the lots that the juniors park at. You could move them up, though. If you move all the staff But you're behind, not getting... If you take the staff lot and put it behind the school, mm -hmm. and you can put all those students, the 85 spots that, that faculty occupy there would be open to students, which is roughly the student capacity in J and K. And then you'd have students and staff, and then in the off hours, you wouldn't have buses there. So for the last two years, we have been trying to put the parents behind the school. Mm -hmm. We set up a pickup zone on the loop road to pick up the children, and uh, that was so unsafe. Yeah, I mean, the, the signs are still there. Yeah. Um, that would be making it a dangerous situation to have the parent pick up, unless you did construction for it, well, making I think the road the wider. It'd have to go in the staff lot. The parent pickup couldn't be on the loop road. I agree, it doesn't work. It would have to queue around the staff lot, which, uh, you know, yeah. eyeballing it, it's like 800 to 1,000 <laughs> feet. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I have tried every possible way to think of how to keep buses from being there. Appreciating the $100,000 financial, you know, incentive, just because 
this great solution is still going to leave me with nowhere to park on parent back to school night or my kids playing on the athletic field. It's frustrating, and I have talked to a bunch of parents of high school students because I have, you know, I'm in that group. And well, maybe we could ask parking. the buses to park off site or at a different school for those nights. Yeah. You know, to another school, they could maybe park at Marathon. That's a good point. You know, just, and you could open up that lot for that. I understand because, you know, they build an elementary school and they have enough parking for the staff, but they don't think about open house and right. curriculum night and so. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a nightmare at every school. It is. It is. Well, you, you heard uh, Ms. Carver just I speak know. about that, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that is that is a difficulty in every school. Well, well that's because of a field that's no longer. So, but phase two, or right, that's phase the two is the next phase, would allow for more parking spaces to be put onto the campus that would hopefully address some of that. Yeah, I, I mean, there is a potential as we continue to march down this this path like I said you know those two different looks you could be adding you know 92 spaces or 55 spaces so you know there is there is potential to keep going and expanding your available parking but those involve tearing down the White House likely before it falls down <laughs> <laughs> well I mean I, I just worry I mean phase two I think the phasing is great we have so many expenses coming down the pike I'm just nervous about how much capacity we have to invest in traffic versus educational capacity and you know it's well we'd have an extra hundred thousand dollars to do it if we had the buses buses in town though mm -hmm. I mean that would be the yeah but there's no real rush to do phase two and phase three right now it's there's a rush to do this yeah. for the safety of the front of the school yeah. so I mean you you could postpone that if if you know you wanted to spend the money more for education but and this ties back to the vote to appropriate, I can't remember the 300, number, 300, dollars to finish off this project, right? Which is good for a certain, a finite period of time. Yes? Well, I mean, so like I said, the what was appropriated at the May 18 town meeting was phase one of the campus master plan, which is a school bus lot mm -hmm. on field nine. Um, so the 300000 would be to actually complete that based on the estimates, based on the design that was required, all the stormwater management, all the landscaping, everything that needed to be done okay. to continue the project. If the decision was to not move forward, then the decision should be to pull it off the warrant and give back the money to the town because it was voted for this. Right. And there's no time, I mean, this is still preliminary, there's no timeline as to when it would be done. I mean, is the goal uh, to try to finish it in the summer again, or is... So we, we have a letter of intent with a contractor uh, that if it's voted at town meeting to move forward and okay. build it this summer. Okay. And finish before school starts. <laughs> yes. yes. All right. So... <laughs> That's the plan. Yeah. On our agenda, uh, we do not have a, a motion to move this forward or not, so I would like to propose that we put this off for a vote until the next meeting, in part because we're missing one member, and in part because I I feel that if the community had anything they wanted to say before we push it forward with the final vote, I would like to have that opportunity um, for people to voice their opinion. Uh, I, I will say kind of in with regard to the safety, because that is the biggest piece here to me. I, I, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. of How much of a safety concern do you think this is? Like, how concerned are you? I think the you know the, the major thing is separating buses from the cars. It's just a um, you know an accident waiting waiting to happen, and um, you know and the superintendent brought up a good point too in in the area of emergency planning. And I know the fire chief would talk to that as well. But uh, if you ever had to evacuate the school, you could shelter in place people, especially if there was foul weather or, or things going on. You could shelter in place uh, the kids in the. Um, in the buses in the lot so yeah I mean the kids you know running through the buses the kids running through the parking lots with all the parents parked in the rows I, I you know I think it's a, a real dangerous situation there you know 
You've been saying that for a couple of years. You, you have, but you I have wanted been. to. Yeah. <laughs> right, I, I just right. wanted I know, to bring, bring I mean, that all, out. All the buses discussion. in the back, you know, they're shut off. They're in their assigned spots. You know, once all the kids are on the bus, then, you know, we have walkie-talkies. You know, we give the green light to, for the buses to leave. We have monitors in the, you know, I think there's like two to three monitors out in that parking lot in the front, you know, just watching to make sure our kids aren't running through the buses. And, you know, you can't see these kids in front of the bus. So I think having it in the back, you have more control. Um, I think there's going to be cameras put out in that area, so that could be monitored too. Uh, the safety of the buses too. Um, I yeah, just, I do worry know. about vandalism with the buses. Yeah. Like I think that parking lot with cameras and lights makes sense. Yes. I mean, I know there's already a camera out there. I think it, you know, it just has to be adjusted to point it more on the buses. But, uh, it just scares me every day just to see these kids, you know, go into their cars and the parents, you know, just watching some of the way they drive and the kids trying to get to the bus loop. I like to see the bus loop eliminated from, uh, if it's a parent pickup, that would be eliminated from the kids parking there for sports. Anybody from JK that wanted to come up closer. The senior lot's still going to be available. A lot of the teachers leave by 2 o'clock, so there would be a lot of staff spots that are available to the kids. I just, you know, every day I get a complaint of how the kids are, are driving too fast into that bus loop and not waiting for all the buses to exit before they start pulling in. So. If we move ahead with the bus lot, and say a year from now, we come up with a new phase two that moves the buses a little bit more remotely on the campus and repurposes that lot for staff potentially as we as we kind of fine tune our vision for phase two. Might that be a possibility? Sure. The whole the whole thing is handling, <coughs> you know, drop off and dismissal. Yeah. You know, so if we push the buses further in the back. We'd have to still come up with that solution of where are they doing dismissal, unless the kids are going to walk all the way down the loop road to get to the buses down there. Right, and we, and if we move the parents from the front, we can't use the bus loop as the bus loop still. If the parent pickup is going behind the school, we couldn't use the bus loop. Is it because the documents all talked about separating, and I wasn't clear if like a raised curb because right now the students feel very safe. Their students, they always think they're invincible, yeah. but they feel very safe because when they come out of the middle school and the high school, they don't go anywhere. If they're going to the bus, they could just get on the bus. Like cars can't. But it'll be there. the same, just in the back. Yeah. Plus, um, you're also so right now you have probably ninety percent of the kids entering the school in the morning through that door, the the, the two front doors. This is going to be separating. All the, the how, how many ride the 1500. bus? 1,500. 1,500 would be coming through the back door, and all the drop-offs would be going through the front door. So it's separating it. Uh, they're entering the building in, in two different areas. Yeah. And I think it would be easier to get to the classrooms, too. And, and the uh, foyer area wouldn't be as packed as it is now. Right. Okay. I think one of the problems with using the bus loop area, which we encounter now for parking, is that when somebody shows up at 12.30 and puts their car there, and then a bus gets there at 1.15, there's who owns that car in the parking lot. And I'll tell it's you. Pretty it's pretty embarrassing when you uh, ticket the superintendent. It's pretty embarrassing when it's the superintendent's car, I'm just saying. Oh, and, I, and I'm still there. <laughs> We can't let that happen. No, it does happen. I speak from I, experience. I am and there wasn't Carol. There wasn't Carol. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a previous one. <laughs> I, I am very compelled by the safety piece alone. Uh, also by the fact that um, there would be some money coming back into the schools where we definitely need that uh, for some of the other educational things we have. Uh, I don't know if other people want to speak to it, um, and, and in addition to speak to the thought of moving it, the vote, because we did not put on our agenda that we were voting this. That's a good idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I do want to thank Ms. Rothermick for having heard us and done all this research and worked with people who put safety first, and did I hear that really number one in the country? That's correct. Thank you so much for uh, you know, continuing to do what you do for our town. 
thought someone was messing with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say I was not surprised. <laughs> This also will increase, you know, income for more students to park on the campus too. So because you're opening up at least 20 or 30 spots in front of the school, so times a couple hundred bucks. There we go. $155 a student. That's great. Well, yeah. And it's not time sensitive, right? We're okay if we wait till whatever our April next 4th. meeting is. So d just to remind you, at this point in time, the school committee has already voted for this to be on the town meeting yes. warrant. Right. So your vote on the 31st of January was to just we voted to move it along in the capital with to, our capital items so do we in fact need another vote on this it, to be honest unless you're reversing your vote we don't need it I don't believe you do what you um, your motion on January 31st because I had to go back and see what exactly it was myself um, was just to review um, with the school committee prior to proceeding with the project. So unless you're reversing the vote, which you right now it to. is on town meeting. Um, so and in order to reverse the vote, um, it, we would need a motion for somebody need a to, motion to, a motion to reopen the vote, and then it would have to be postponed to a f future meeting. <laughs> would be the, right. I so I just want to ask this question. I, 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 as I recall, um, I think we had made some a motion around exploring other options. So that, and that's where I was trying to say that the the money, the the question was, could the money that's already been appropriated be used to build a parking lot somewhere else in town? Right. And that's where I was saying it, the way it was worded for town meeting, it could not, right, right. because it was phase one of the master plan, which is why I was re-showing you what that master plan was. So. And the wording says on the high school campus. On the, yes. <laughs> so that that so is not. So one of the avenues later on in your agenda, we're going to give you an update on the FY20 budget, which includes the um, operating budget and the capital plan. Um, so short of this not having a motion, if you were to vote down the capital plan if, later on in the agenda, otherwise I think moving forward you're you're all set okay so i would suggest that we s can plan to stand with the vote we have unless somebody makes a motion <laughs> to open it back up and wants to in in that case we will push it forward if we vote so to the next meeting so that's Nan, did you have any <laughs> this is a hard one for me um I'm going to sit. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to cozy up with this idea. <laughs> OK, then um, hearing, hearing nothing there, we, I will move oh, into. So thank you, actually, before we move yeah, anywhere. I just want to thank you both much. for coming. Yeah, this is great. You bring a level of um, comfort just in hearing <laughs> your perspective on it. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Susan. For Thanks. Have a good night. Good night. Yes, great too. to see you. <laughs> I always like to think, hope you have a quiet night. <laughs> right, right. All right, so that brings us back uh, down to liaison reports. So, oh, I have one of those. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, speaking to the policy working group, we just did a couple of quick visual, although it's a, it's, I can give it to you verbally, but it's good with the visual. So we'll use the slides. We met today, um, just to update you on what we're, we're working on right now. Um, our focus right now is standardizing the naming. And if you look at our policy manual, you will see a mix of policies, procedures, and forms, and a little bit of whatnot that's out there in our policy. So what we are trying to do to make things um, <coughs> more comprehensible to everybody in the community, including ourselves, is to standardize the naming of forms and procedures. Um, so the current condition is you'll have a policy, and then it would be a dash R1, dash E1, dash 1. There's kind of a mix of suffixes, and it could be a form, it could be a procedure, it could be anything. So we are um, moving to, with the process of changing to the naming convention that you see. So if there's a procedure that hangs under a policy, it'll be the policy code, dash PRC, and then a number, sequential number, 1, 2, 3, 4. Same with forms, again, the policy code, a dash, FRM, and then the number. And hopefully we won't have a lot of the whatnot 
as we're going through. But if there is a reference document, um, which we found potentially one of, it'll be the policy code dash, I think, REF, and then a number. Um, so that when you look at something, you clearly know what you're going to get when you click on it. So we're going through this. If we just, Carol, go to the next slide. Um, so the status of the cleanup is that we've reviewed all the policies alphabetically through IHBG dash E1, which clearly violates our name. <laughs> um, so there, there are a couple of different outcomes in our review. One is it's a simple rename, and I gave you a few examples here, like we had EEA dash one, it'll become EEA dash PRC one, it's a procedure, it's bus safety. Mm. Um, and you can see, read those examples, but we, we don't think those need a vote from the school committee, that's just mm -hmm. a naming change, it's not a content change. So we'll just go ahead and do those unless there's any objection. Um, there are a few things that we're finding that don't really belong on the list at all. Um, and we'll share with you the list of those things that we find. I gave you a couple of examples here. Um, there's ACER, which is a grievance procedure for complaints alleging violation in Section 504, et cetera. It's, this content is not really a procedure. It's, um, and all of it is contained within our handbooks, which the high school and middle school handbooks are policy. Um, and the elementary handbook has this language as well. So we don't really understand why it's in our policy manual. We don't think it belongs there. Um, it's not in the, the um, Massachusetts uh, School Committee reference manual. So that's an example of something we think could just come off. It, it doesn't really add any value. Um, likewise, IHAMB-E1 is the parent sex ed notice. It's actually a form letter. We don't, we're not in the habit of putting form letters that principals and other administrators use in our policy manual, um, so it probably doesn't belong there. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the policy or how we implement it. It's just a, a sample letter that principals can use. So there are some things that will come up that we're going to recommend we just take off, just as a heads up. And then the last slide. Um, and then there are some that as we're, you know, going through this sort of global cleanup and looking at all these policies, we are still finding things that um, need a little bit more review. And it's possible that this one we just stumbled on today, the ACAB sexual harassment policy. It's kind of a mix of policy and procedure. The MASC reference policy is also a mix of policy and procedure, and it's got some hard-coded names. It's not really a good model for us. So we just kind of tag that as for review later, and that will come back to the school committee if we make any changes. So that's kind of what we're up to. Um, and we're hoping this will also be good groundwork for the cutover to the new website. So when the policies go live, they'll be clean. This is great. Did I miss anything? I think so. But I, I mean, the things that we're considering taking out are not policy. So it wouldn't be something that would affect all of us because Anything. yeah, they're it, they're just we, we every once in a while we find some random document in there that is you know at some time was very important but at the moment it's no longer relevant to whatever it is that we're doing so yeah Amanda did a great job and there are some cross references to ghost documents that right we don't know ghost they yeah, we don't know where fine. they are what they are we can't they, they don't exist any longer so um, we're cleaning that as we go That's great. thank you. I have some updates. All right. Um, so the first one is uh, Dr. Kavanaugh talked about it, the seal of biliteracy. This was something that was started uh, over a year ago, I think, about a year oh, ago. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. And then I was so excited to see that work finally taking off. We've missed you, Ms. Parson, at that meeting, and Jill Kimball and uh, Ms. Marlene Mon Ma Miracle. No. Yes, thank you. Uh, Miss Miracle, they were fabulous. They've done so much groundwork on it. So this year, the focus of the seal of biliteracy is uh, purely at the high school level with all the tests and whatnot and making sure kids have that seal ready to go as they're graduating. So the discussion was more around, um, you know, what we would do in, in terms of giving out the seal, what the seal looks like, etc. What would it mean for distinction? But going into the next year, the focus is more about pathways as to how can we bring that work down to um, lower grades, uh, middle school, uh, down to elementary. My hope is that we start at the earliest grade levels because kids are talking about, you know, speaking in those languages very early on. But then you don't have tests 
um, related to that. So we had some good conversation around what could it look like? Could it be a poem that someone reads, the kids read? Could we have like a night where um, all of this assessment can happen? And how can we engage community members to be the assessors, if you will? So there's a test that the kids have to take in order to um, certify um, that they are literate in this other world language, if you will. Exciting news is there are 46 world languages spoken in our uh, community. 46? 46. That's fantastic. So that, that was seems like bigger than last year. I think last year was about 43. I think we've had okay. three new and, um, you know, some of them I've never heard at all. That's so that was, it's learning. But again, Miss <coughs> Kimball and Miss uh, Miracle. Fabulous. So that's on the seal of biliteracy, exciting work ahead. And, you know, last time when, uh, you know, we have a new board and we don't have it in the list of uh, subcommittees, if you mm -hmm. will. So I just wanted to check if everyone's okay with me continuing uh, on that committee. Oh, for seal of biliteracy? Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> check that I might off. check. <laughs> mm, the other one is on the processes front. Um, you know, we had talked about a little bit that uh, Nancy and I would work on some of the school committee processes. So one of the things that we took up as a first item is on the agenda. And I, I think, Amanda, you had also talked about it. So we're trying to put together a calendar of through the entire year, what are the areas through uh, we go through with regard to the agenda. So, um, a skeleton or a framework, if you will, a, a skeletal framework um, to kind of guide us through what those agendas look like, how many of these are initiated by community members. So for instance, we have uh, Mr. Kildiff usually come in for the 26.2 and BAA Foundation or some of the items which are field trip related. So we're kind of trying to draw out what the agendas look like so that if any one of us want to bring in what is the time frame where we see some uh, possibilities. So more on that later. We had a good conversation on that. We had a great conversation on that and I think you're not, um, you're, you're humble and you don't highlight how much work you actually put into setting up the spreadsheet that I think is really going to help us going forward and to, to be able to look at what we're doing as a, a larger planning process. That was really great. I was very impressed. So thank, thank you. you. I'm excited for everybody to see it. That's check. Uh, a few more. One, one more is the Marathon Fund Committee. Uh, we, had a, we had a very good meeting. We had um, uh, um, someone from the middle school, Michael Webb, uh, who is a coach as well as a, uh, he's part of the START program. He had come with a funding request, uh, and uh, that isn't a consideration. So it's nice to be on the other side and kind of listen to some of it, and that's a possibility. But on the Marathon Fund Committee, I'm helping uh, and working with uh, Josh Grossetti from the town side to kind of highlight some of the work that the Fund Committee does. It's a fabulous group of people. Um, and on the community communication front, we have been growing quite a bit, and we feel that we are getting to that place where we possibly, uh, we, have ha we have had no chair, no vice chair, none of that, so we're getting to that place where we feel we need to formalize some of the work, so that's something that's happening on the community communications group. Last but not the least, on the senior center front, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh um, has been able to initiate some work uh, with Karen Renaud, is it? Mm -hmm. And with Amy Beck, who is our senior center director, to um, put together a program possibly in May for seniors called Senior Prom. Um, more details to come. So very exciting work there. And there's one thing that I have not been doing a great job of, which I would like some help with, is uh, liaison to the planning board. So I, I, you know, if there's anyone who's ready to take that on, that would be a huge help. What time do they meet, Lena? Mondays. And you know, the agreement is that if we can attend even once a month, that's great. And Muriel Kramer is fabulous. Amy Rita Bush, they, they're very good with sharing details. But kind of keeping an eye on the growth and some of the conversations, things that are coming up, is very helpful. I think. Yeah. I'll think. I'll volunteer for that. Do you remember last week when I said that the center school reuse was disbanded or yeah. whatever the word? Is? So you yeah, extra I said time it out now? loud, so now I'm, now I'm on it. Yeah, I get Wait, it. I think absolutely. We had a couple more. Let me look through my. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely.
do we need a formal vote for that? Or be good? Um, well, so you want to go ahead and make a motion and, and we yes. can have a formal vote. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to replace uh, me. <laughs> with me. <laughs> the, the, yes, the Jen Devlin as the motion. liaison to the planning board. I second. All Thank those you. in favor? Uh, aye, yes. aye. It is unanimous. And welcome Absolutely. aboard to the planning board liaison. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. I have one quick liaison report. Really Wait. fast. The elementary school building committee continues to meet periodically, but I'm, it's to the point now where it's just essentially approving invoices, paying people who have done something in order to maintain the, or to finish off the construction of the building. So it's it, the, another reason why I should probably volunteer for the planning board liaison is because these meetings are very quick now because it, it's done. And I know Mrs. Debeau in the audience here, there's so much, um, you know, such an awesome school and it's coming to the end. And I think it's, it's tough. The folks in that board are kind of like, you know, it's weird to leave that some of them have been together for six, six, seven, it's a long time, right? Yeah, I've been there for two years. Some of them have been together for a really long time, so it's it's a tough breakup. But, <laughs> but I'll yeah. still bring you chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> there was a bowl there last night, and everyone was like, oh, my Lord. Yeah, it was great. So, go ahead. Um, that's it. That's all I got. I'll have planning board for you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. I have just a quick one. Uh, I, there was a CPAC meeting this week, uh, which went very well. There was a very nice group of parents, a large group of parents, and some newer faces, which is always fun. And the biggest update was the ESY uh, program, which we've heard a lot about here, the extended school year program and some programmatic changes that are going on there in the pilot program that is being worked on. And, and actually, I'm going to point to Robin, because I know that you're on that subcommittee, uh, which has been great work, I know but doing a pilot for the intensive program to add some additional time for social uh, and emotional type stuff. And they're going to do some field trips and some really wonderful opportunities for them. So that's exciting. All right. So that then we are a little bit behind schedule. So we'll see if we can um, well, we, we catch up here. But that brings us into new business. And the first item of new business we have is the Marathon Elementary Gift Account. So these should go very quickly. Um, we are looking for your approval to accept $520 in a gift check from Sager Sports in Medway, uh, and that will be going to Marathon. Motion. <laughs> Seeking a motion to approve the fund, the fi um, 520, am I on the right? Yeah, $520 gift check from Sager Sports Com Corp for the Marathon Elementary School gift account. So moved. Second. Mina with the motion and Jen with the second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And it is unanimous and so passes. And that brings us to the Elmwood School Gift Account. Yes. Um, from the same source, Sager Sports Corporation in Medway. Um, this time it's for $168, and that's going to the Elmwood School. That's great. So I would seek a motion to approve the $168 <laughs> gift check for the Elmwood Elementary Gift Account. So moved. Well, second by Mina, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. And it is moved unanimously and that brings us down to budget transfers with Ms. Rothermay. Thank you. Um, based off of the financial update that I showed you earlier, uh, the first budget um, transfer would be to move some of the Elmwood general supply and guidance travel money into Elmwood professional development and that's just really focusing on some um, professional development that uh, they would like to do at the Elmwood school. The second one is from Mr. Person, and this is really looking at some of the overages in the marathon gas. As I said, you know, these are estimates that were put together as part of the building, ones that we adjusted in the future for FY20. Um, as, as we kind of thought, we are going over budget in that, um, but we do have some savings in um, Hopkins and just really kind of covering some of the other overages in the uh, contract services. I move to approve the budget transfers. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, second, second. second by Mina. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Yes. Aye. Thank you. And then that moves us into uh, item D, which is the middle school paraprofessional need. And Mr. Keller, would you like to come up? Carol. Carol. Do you want that? Is that mm -hmm. relevant? Is that it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so um, I've had conversations with Dr. Zaleski, and uh, together we uh, are making this request. Um, we had a student move in uh, in mid-February um, and uh, attempted um, in the past several weeks to manage uh, internally with paraprofessionals that we have internally uh, and have not been able to successfully do that. So uh, ultimately, that is why we are bringing this request for uh, an additional paraprofessional to be added uh, at this time. Do we know we have, I mean, we need to, but we have money for yes. this too. So, yes. so the funding source um, really is because right at this time we're still running a positive variance. Okay. Um, so in conversations with Dr. Zaleski and, and forward looking, it looks as though based on that, that we would be able to fund this position. Okay. Okay. So then I would seek a motion to approve the middle school paraprofessional for FY 2019 and FY 20. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Appreciate Thanks that. Okay, that moves us down into the recruiting schedule for the Director of Student Services, and that is you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. So in your packet, um, you can see that uh, Ms. Polnick did post for the position on March 4th, and uh, the timeline is there for you. So the posting went up on March 4th, and it will be closing next Friday on March 29th. Uh, what will happen next is um, Ms. Parson and I will take a look at all of the resumes that we have um, gathered to date and we will you know sort of select those ones who have credentials to actually serve in that role and so once we separate those out um, that will be during the week of April 1st we will hand those over to Ms. Polnick and a screening committee that she's going to be putting together and she will be meeting with that screening committee during the week of um, April 1st and then um, interviews will happen during the week of April 8th uh, in the following week, the successful candidates will be meeting with um, central office personnel, so Ms. Parson, Ms. Rothamick, and I, and then we will be bringing forth the successful candidates to the school committee for your approval. So what I've done is I've put up there the um, DESE guidelines around hiring the um, next director of student services in the district and I know that that's very difficult for you to read so I will read it um, according to state law um, if we are a district that has fewer than 4,000 students um, the school committee then appoints um, the successful candidate uh, it tells us that a school committee shall appoint a person to be its administrator of special education and just so we have a sense of how that plays out and what my role is in it and I know that that uh, highlighted part in the center there is very difficult to read so I will read it on my screen um, it does say the superintendent manages the hiring process and selects the candidate keeping the school committee informed and the committee votes on the appointment based on the superintendent's recommendation so that's how that will work I will share with you now what Ms. Pulnick recommends to be that first <coughs> round of hiring committee so, let's see. I don't know if that's this is I'm one. I just want to make sure I've got the okay. They're all the same, right? Okay. Okay. Yep. So after Jen and I go through that stack and um, take a look at the resumes that are in there and who might be qualified to hold the position, we move those names on to a um, a committee of volunteers who will actually conduct a, a whole round of interviews. Um, what Ms. Polnick is recommending is that she would chair that and I would also recommend that she do that our HR director is exceptional in running searches uh, she does it all the time and um, she would also reach out to all of the people who appear on this list so in terms of administration she's recommending one secondary principal one elementary principal and the director of technology for professional staff she is looking for um, an elementary CISP personnel or a SPED teacher, a secondary CISP person um, or a SPED teacher, an elementary team chair and a secondary team chair. So there would be four professional staff. Um, she's looking for one special education administrative support staff who would probably be the secretary to the director of student services, Ms. Kresko. And then we would be looking for a parent or a community member and a CPAC rep. So. I believe this is the group that she had put together when we hired Ms. Rothermick, and I think that this is the group she had put together the last time we hired 
a director of student services. So I leave that to you. So I think I would like to see an additional, either a school committee rep or an additional parent rep on there. I don't know if others have any. I was surprised not to see a school committee I, rep, but I haven't been through this before, so I'm still <coughs> learning. I'm not against that. It's a big, it's a big committee already, so yeah. I mean, it's it's fine with me. It would make it an. It, I think there's ten now, so it would make it eleven. Eleven is probably a better number, I would think, in terms of. To vote, you have a, an odd number. Yep. Oh, it's eleven. No, it's, it's, 11 it's now. ten. No, no, because the the parent community member is the CPAC member, so it's it's oh, eight, it and then okay. the two. No, no. So there's only ten. Oh, okay. Ten I was right. I was added. thinking of a parent community member and a CPAC rep. <coughs> okay. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. I thought that correct. I yeah. I thought the CPAC person was the because there's a colon there. I thought that I was see. the parent community member. Right. Uh, I see. Um. I don't know about that though, Nancy, because there's a colon after the special ed administrative support staff too. A colon then to the next column. The That's well, wh clear. where it says four professional staff and there's a colon. The the numbers right. that are under there are, are included in that four. It I says four professional yeah. staff, then one elementary. Mm -hmm. It's not four. So there's four. nine. There's there's ten on here. Ten. <laughs> uh, I see. Okay, got it. Got it. So I would think more than one parent. You would think yes. More than one yes. parent. That would be. I, I would think. Either a school committee member or an I or an or additional, additional CPAC, right? Or either it, it could be two CPAC members or it could be. I would be fine with that as well. Does that, unless is are there parents of children with special needs that aren't members of CPAC? Should we make it specific to CPAC, or should so we make we it could, well? So that would I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that question. So, so I prefer to so. I don't actually believe when we say, I mean, CPAC's open for anybody to join, but I think we could, to kind of reach a broader audience, we could do, get it out of two ways. Typically what we've done when we've invited CPAC members on to our, any of our selection committees is we ask the board to select somebody of their own, from their own group. It doesn't have to be a CPAC board member, but it should be somebody CPAC. We could do that, and then in addition to that, we could have the second parent person be sent out through like the have a listserv sent to all parents who have children uh, who are on an IEP or 504. Services. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, to, does that make sense to you to do it that way? It does, or, surely. Yeah. And does that, um, are you guys okay with there not being, a, if there are two parents not having a school committee member um, on there? Or do you? I wonder, I mean, I'm fine either which way. I wonder, you know, I know Meg is not here. Uh, yes. If, uh, she would have liked to be on the. She could. Well, she could be though as the CPAC rep, as well. Okay. That it would if be there a two, two for one. It would be. It, there would still be two CPAC members. So I, I guess I'm, we're maybe getting caught up in semantics because she could represent either she the can. school committee or CPAC. I see. And, in and the five of you will have a vote at the end. Like you'll yes. have the final appointment yes. for the position. Um, and in terms of um, uh, the schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, would you have any idea of how often this committee would meet and, you know, how many rounds? Is there any sense of the time commitment required of uh, the community members? It's and typically not onerous. So of those 11 people that you see on this sheet, they would meet once with Kim Polnick to determine who was asking what questions. And so that meeting is, you know, maybe it takes an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and then the day of the interviews, you know, you might sit through three, four, five, six interviews, depending upon how many candidates that the two of us put forward. So I would say it's probably the better part of a day and um, maybe like an hour's sort of training, if you will. Okay. So a question uh, in terms of community participation. I know that the school committee interviews are public and that what we've done in the past yeah. is we have provided feedback forms that people could give feedback that were at the meeting uh, mm -hmm. for the school committee to consider. Is that something that will be done? Sure, that's fine. Could be done, yeah. okay. That in, makes sense. And do we ha know how many finalists we're looking for to advance to that? Is there a particular number or just based on what you see is how many you'll advance forward? I would say that we're really just looking to see who applies, who's you know sort of qualified for the position, right? <coughs> 
Yeah. And this is strictly um, Kim Polnick running it. We don't have an outside consulting agency. That's correct. Okay. We do not. Okay. We're not using a consulting agency for this position. So in just to kind of go back to what you were saying at the beginning, just to mm -hmm. tie it all together. So after sure. the school committee interview, um, you will make a recommendation to us. Is so that what will happen is, you know, I will make a recommendation of, you know, maybe one or two candidates who will come forward and, you know, have that sort of public form. And then right. after that, I will make a recommendation to you. But, you know, you always have the power of veto. Right? Sure, sure. Yeah. But that's it. it it helps to so have to your speak. well. It helps to have your um, recommendation. Yes, and I think that really the experts are the people who are in the schools who sort of know the role, they know the credentials, and and they kind of know what they're looking for. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, then. Um, if there are no other questions, I would seek a motion to. Well, actually, we'll to approve the recruiting schedule and the. We'll do two separate motions. The recruiting schedule for the Director of Student Services. So moved. A second. So motion by Mina, a second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. So that passes. And then a, um, mo a separate motion to... Uh, Maybe, should we just call that a, establish a committee for hiring the Director of Student Services as opposed to a subcommittee? It feels like it's odd wording. Sure. So... Um, a motion to approve the formation of a committee. Of, is that what we want to say? A, a yeah, formation of a committee for the director of student services recruiting. A, Maybe for, high, for interviewing for, the director of student services. I mean, that's what that committee will do, right? Committee. They will work as the, that sort of second line of in the selection. I mean, they're the screening committee. Screening committee. Mm -hmm. it, it, well, they're not screening the inter the resumes, though, are they? No, the second well, the resumes. Yeah, they're the screening it to the next level, though. Okay. And they'll come back with a recommendation, correct? Yes. So, you so, know, so they may find that of six people, three of them felt, you know, good to them, right? And then those folks would be moved on to the central office level of, of interviews. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's the task of the... Uh, you know, I guess we've used the word subcommittee typically because they are under the school committee, right? It is that... That is true. It, it should actually, I think, be a subcommittee because it is something that is that is under our authority. That because we are we have the authority to create it. But there is something odd about the wording there. I, I don't know if it's recruiting or. I can't see it, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, for interviewing and making a recommendation back to the school committee for the hiring of a director of They wouldn't services. be making the recommendation back to the school committee. So they a formation right. of a subcommittee. To, to identify finalists? To identify finalists. Uh, okay. I like that. Yeah. OK, so would you like to make that motion? I would like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion to approve the processes outlined by Kim Polnick to create a committee. Oh my gosh. To, what was it, what did I say now? to recommend finalists for the position of Director of Student Services. I second that. A motion by Amanda and a second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that so moves. And we will look forward to seeing the um, candidates when they come forward. Yes. And we will keep you apprised That's as nice. we move into the month of April. Great. And then the next item we have here is the transportation audit presentation, which yeah. is not in the packet. Yeah. Believe. So unfortunately, we did not receive the final report in time. For, for the packet, so okay. hopefully That's in the next meeting. Okay, so yep. So so we're not going to discuss this at all. So we're we not just we just caught up. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would have been better schedule. We, yeah. we will look forward to seeing that because I know that will have some important information. So have you received it? I have received it. Excuse me, in okay. draft form. Great, so that I we can get it. I did not want to no, no, I, I present want, the draft. I, I think I, it's more important to present the final. I appreciate that, um, and I will look forward to seeing it <laughs> next time. Yep. So that brings us into the unified track coaching stipends, um, and that is you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. So last year, you approved, um, 
unified track and you approved some coaching stipends at that point in time. And what we had suggested then was that we would pilot that program for a couple of years. But what we've learned is that we can really only pilot it for a sort of single year before we have to establish an actual stipend. So the stipend amount that we're looking at right now is $2,000. And so I am looking for you to approve the coaching stipend for the unified track coaches. I will make a motion. Do it. I'll make a motion to approve the stipend for unified track coaching. That's great. So motion. Second. Second. Motion by Amanda, a second by Mina. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And that so carries. And that moves us into the uh, FY20 budget. So that is your name. Do you want me oh, to yes, just jump in? Oh, no, I, oh, I thought, yes, that would be fine. I thought that that was yours. Sorry. No, nope, and that's fine. So, um, you know, as you know, we continue to meet, obviously, with the town manager and, and the finance um, um, group, if you will. So we have been asked or tasked to continue to reduce the budget um, for FY20. And really, it's uh, around a strategy, I believe, and I'm, I'm not going to um, you know, make full assumptions, but I believe it is still an effort uh, by the Board of Selectmen to reduce the tax impact. Um, so they are trying to do different things to do what they can to try to bring down the budget, if you will. So in working collaboratively um, with the town manager, We've identified two areas in the operating budget, um, $10,000 for the marathon gas line item and $5,000 for the building and grounds summer help that we feel we could reduce the FY20 budget in an effort to um, try to help them along with their, with their mission. Um, in addition, then we had a long discussion about the capital requests. So as you know, the, the actual funding of the capital request is really the purview of the town manager, whether those are going to be pay-as-you-go or put out as, as debt. You know, he, he makes those decisions. Um, so in switching some things around, um, he was actually able to open up a little bit um, some of the projects for us, but we also look to... Um, reduce some of our projects. So you'll see the, the net effect was a reduction of our full capital ask um, by 34800 And you can see the details of each of those um, and then the chart in, in the back. What it does is it does, um, the, the big things is redu reducing that wetlands order of conditions. Um, so again, at this point in time, we do not have an actual estimate of what that will cost. This was an estimate that was given to us by the engineering company when they were um, doing the turf field. This was a preliminary estimate, so that number did come from something. We're hoping that you know the, the actual will come in less, um, and if not, we'll have to go to town meeting again in another year and try to complete that task. But it also does allow us to move forward with the kitchen equipment and move forward with the vehicle, which it, um, the previous requests were eliminated for, for our capital. So I feel it was a good um, collaborative effort, I guess, if you will, to work with the town, um, still continue to move forward some of the capital projects that we need, and also um, some areas within the operating budget where I feel we, we could make some, some movement. So you were so the numbers came down from um, Marathon because of um, more realistic get, um, utilities, is that correct? Well, so the gas, we increased significantly because, again, we, you know, the argument right. has been we, d we don't know where that's going to come in. And as you saw from the budget transfers, mm -hmm. we are going over budget. But in projecting out, I think we'll still come in below what we budgeted for 20. So it's still a difficult year to gauge because mm -hmm. you have, um, you know, even though we'll have more history, some things are still kind of running on a commissioning schedule, if right. you will. 
So, you, you know, you're still having utilities that are doing this as opposed to really normalizing. Mm -hmm. um, probably will take a good two years to get a real normalizing schedule. So I do feel there's room to bring that down a little. Okay. Mr. Othmick, I um, actually read through the memo that was very well written. Um, one request that I have put forth in the past also is some description on all those items. It simply gives the highlight. It doesn't give any detail in there. So if we just say capacity study and $50,000, or if we say, you know, bus parking lot, um, say 200000 or 300000 I'm you know, speaking the numbers off the top of my head. I think it helps. I know that we talk about this, but to have it right on the document, I think it's very helpful for the school committee as well as for the community when we are asking for something that's adding up to $1.3 million. I'm rounding that up. I think it's helpful if, if we can add some level of detail. So if you recall in that uh, school committee questions document, I had put in the detail of every capital item. So it it is in that document that was that is shared with, with the committee. It's in a document? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think like you, I think you were more in the packet so that the community sees it. Not like a working document for us, but more um, baked into the process. Just so that as people are going through this, if they're following along at home, mm -hmm. they um, real time can have their memory jogged. It's just hard when they're not working with it from day to day and I understand some of it is you know this is just a projection you don't have everything nailed down in terms of mm -hmm. details but to just have some high level I think that'd be helpful and I have to look back at which document are we talking about I mean, this is the one here all the questions that are it's oh. it's long but it's yeah how, how yeah I have a question about the questions document but we'll um, we'll get through that how pressing is the wetlands order of condition. Is this the one that we inherited that had been sort of mm -hmm. overlooked? That's okay, correct. so in, because we made a significant cut, as you mentioned. So if, if for some reason 40,000 is not sufficient and we can't do it this year, it's not urgent. Well, it's been about 20 years. It's been, so <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the date on it, yeah, yeah. Just want to be clear. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is something that, you know, from our perspective, we would like cleaned up. Correct. And, yeah. you know, I believe from the Conservation Commission's perspective, they would like cleaned up. So it is something that we don't want to continue to perpetuate. Right. It has been a problem that we inherited. You're, you're correct. Yeah. Um, somebody's got to shut the door and get it done. Yeah. So we're hoping that we still can. Okay. It might be realistic even at that low, lower number. You know, I... Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, you know, the... the um, the uh, replication was reduced from a two to one to a 1.5 to one. Okay. You know, so that, you know, how much effect will that have on the number? The actual location, which we've identified um, as the potential of where it will be, will have effect on the number because of access. Okay. You know, the harder it is to access, obviously the number goes up. So all these factors play into what that number finally will be. Okay. But they're doing that study currently. Okay. Um, I don't know that we'll have a a good number for town meeting, but um, you know we'll have to continue to march forward and, like I said, just shut the door and get this done. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Um, with regard to the questions documents, you're talking about that common shared drive mm -hmm. where we're posting the questions. I actually want to bring back that process once and make sure that you know many times by the questions that one asks, that can you know kind of show. I want to just make sure that there's no violation in terms of OML or what have you with regard to the process. And, you know, when you ask a question that can imply where you're leaning towards, so I just want to be on the clear with regard to that process. Um, well, and that's why it, it's always, whenever it's shared, it is not for deliberation. It's really to make sure that if one member is asking a question of us for further clarification, it's information that the whole committee deserves to have sure. so that everybody has that same knowledge base. Sure. But again, it is not for deliberation. Okay. Yeah, like I said, you know, maybe, maybe we bring it back uh, just for all of us to review, and perhaps you have thought through all of this and that uh, there are no concerns there. Thank you. So you need a motion to approve this that's change correct. in the capital and 
I, I'm not good with looking at visual math. And so the operating budget for the motion, the new budget would be forty-eight million zero four four nine hundred and fifty. Um, and that represents a 6.63% increase. We were at 667 And has this been reviewed with the town manager closely? Yes, yes. that's what okay, perfect. we did. That's we did this, this together from. with the town manager. Right. And then the capital number would be what you can see. You can make the motion based on the chart that's part of the memo. Okay, so I would like to entertain to see if there's a motion to approve the revised operating and capital budgets as outlined by Ms. Rodmick. So moved. Second. Motion by Mina and a second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, both for really, and all of your team for sharpening your pencils in a way that's whittling it down to, to meet the need for the town. A lot of negotiation there. I know. I I have seen that, and I I know it's not easy when we've already cut so much out of our budget to find places where you can pull more. So appreciate that. All right. I think I have to scroll back up. That brings us to items by consensus. Is that so? Public comment. Oh yes, but. <laughs> I think we're good with public comment. I do. I think we uh, In that case, then we are ready for items by. Do you have something you want to yes, say? Yes, so in the items by consensus, uh, this is just, you know, just me being picky a little bit there. There was one item that. Uh, I'd like to pull out? No, no. Uh, one of the meeting minutes said, uh, Miss Kavanaugh, I think it's Dr. Kavanaugh who presented it. I think it was about the budget somewhere. Which one? Of the we never get credit for the big stuff. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a good catch. It Which looks like it that? was on no, January 10th. Right, so that I'm should be, that should be, no, 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 it should be corrected January to be reflected 10th. appropriately. Okay. Which one is it? January 10th. It carries 10th, a little bit more um, credibility 10th. if it's Dr. Kavanaugh oh, that did it. Down. Let me get which do you know which one it was? Uh, no, I don't have my January my 10th. Big she said, she no, says, is this the January 10th meeting? No. Which did you, Jen? Did you say which I one? I think it's January 10th, sort of midway down. It but says Dr. Kavanaugh, but then it says Ms. Kavanaugh explained. I mean, it does. Maybe it is yeah, supposed to be Ms. Kavanaugh. Maybe it was Nancy. Maybe I had a smart moment. Oh, please. I actually think that one was supposed to be Ms. Uh, I have to look to see where it is because I don't the know. budget one, I am pretty certain it was Dr. Kavanaugh who presented it. Uh, maybe we're not looking at the right one then. So Dr. Kavanaugh, public comment. How yes. about this? Um, well, we have to check if you want to check. I am so it sorry. Should be accurate. Don't this. It, no, no, it yeah. should be accurate. This yes. is no, we should, we should, we should in check. In months to come or years to come, people may want to question what we did. Uh, and if so they the think I said something, I didn't. All right, doctor. All right, so I'll ch I'll I can check if you want to pull that one off. I'll just make sure that it. it All right, so we'll hold that, that one for correct. the next. I'm just hold sure. that I'm one. See if this is, right. Right. is this where you're talking about right here? Yes, yes. And no, is no, no. I I actually did make that comment okay. because okay. it was changing. It was a change from how it was mm -hmm. in the calendar. That the way it was in the calendar, uh, the initial calendar, it looked like we were going to vote the budget immediately mm -hmm. following the public hearing. Was we'll what the was. We'll go for that. So I, I do actually think that's accurate. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's better to check and to and know that we're the accurate. Rest of the that's <laughs> I took it. I took it. The day. <laughs> and uh, by the way, nice job You're because that's a lot of minutes to. to, 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 to nice to job, Susan McClure. I mean, please. I she's a, she's like, phenomenal. She is like, unbelievably good. I, yes. So, if there are nothing, no other items to be looked at differently here, I would seek a motion to approve the items by cons um, consensus. So moved. We'll have to turn Second. It back. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. Aye. And it is uh, carries, and I would now, and we are only four minutes behind. I just want to highlight that. <laughs> we didn't do transportation. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, I would uh, seek an, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, second. Second. So motion by Mina and a second by Amanda. All those in favor? Uh, yes. And we are, uh, uh, we are adjourned at 925, and our next meeting will take place here in the high school library on April 4th, 2019 at 7 p.m. And thank you all and have a good night.